A Louisiana criminal case is being heard by the highest court in the land, and the outcome could result in new trials for hundreds of inmates convicted of non-unanimous juries in the past. The lone dissenting juror on all the charges says the facts in that case just didn't add up. Paul Dudley tells us how a law professor is making sure the United States Supreme Court knows about her experience. I feel like I was not heard. I feel like I was silenced. That I feel like I did my jury service, but it didn't make a difference. John Ree Taylor says her voice was ignored shortly after deliberations began in the case of Thedrick Edwards. 19-year-old Thedrick Darsha Edwards turned himself in today. The teen was one of six people arrested in a series of rapes, kidnappings, and armed robberies near LSU in Baton Rouge. The other 11 jurors were all white, according to court records, and Taylor says not interested in what she had to say. I believe from their perspective, it was originally pr uh, presumed that I agreed with them that I was going to vote guilty, but once I voiced my opinion that I didn't feel like all of the evidence lined up, there was not enough evidence to convict him, then I felt almost shunned, like they stopped paying attention to the things that I was saying, the things that I was bringing up, which is what they did with the evidence during the actual trial. None of the DNA or fingerprints collected matched Edwards, and to Taylor, prosecutors did not have a single persuasive witness. The other 11 jurors were satisfied with the evidence and voted to convict. Taylor was the only dissenting voice on all of the charges. For somebody who didn't do this to be sitting in jail for 15, almost 20 years, it's, it's kind of like throwing the whole life away. If the trial were held today, the 11 to 1 jury decision would have not been enough to convict Edwards. Louisiana voters threw out non-unanimous juries in 2018 for all cases moving forward. Later, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled non-unanimous juries unconstitutional. But again, this is only for cases moving forward. And that's where the Edwards case comes in. If the justices rule in Edwards's favor and make their prior decision retroactive, Louisiana would have to offer Edwards and hundreds of others still in prison new trials. University of Virginia Associate Professor of Law Thomas Frampton. The Supreme Court is hearing uh, this one case uh, involving Mr. Edwards, but the outcome of the case will affect uh, somewhere north of a thousand uh, current prisoners in Louisiana. We know that overwhelmingly when there were 10 to 2 or 11 to 1 convictions, uh, non-white jurors were wildly overrepresented in who was voting for acquittals, whose votes were being essentially thrown in the trash can. Frampton submitted a 34-page brief to the U.S. Supreme Court written from John Reed Taylor's point of view, the lone black juror who was not only troubled by the lack of physical evidence, but also had many doubts about the confession prosecutors presented to the jury. According to the documents, Edwards had been threatened, physically intimidated, and interrogated before a confession was taped. There was quite a bit of reason to be suspicious about that confession. Uh, police officers actually interrogated him several times, and only during the final interrogation did they bother to turn on the video cameras. Uh, Mr. Edwards uh, testified at the trial and explained that in the first unvideoed interrogations, he was threatened, he was physically assaulted, and that the officers gave him details of the offenses so that when he confessed the third time on video camera, it would seem more persuasive. During the ongoing discussion about non-unanimous jury decisions over the years, there have been those who have said a simple majority should be enough to convict. What would you say to those people? Very, very deeply embedded in our American approach to criminal justice is the idea that we don't strip somebody of their liberty. We don't put them in a cage for a minute, for a year, and certainly not for the rest of their lives, unless we're persuaded beyond a reasonable doubt that they are in fact guilty of the offense. Uh, when we have non-unanimous convictions, uh, we are weakening that critical core feature of American criminal justice. These seem like very reasonable doubts that you have. Exactly. I agree. And, and when you're explaining this to the other jurors, what do they say to you? Well, he was with him, so basically he was guilty by association. 
I mean, even my rebuttal to that was, would you want your son or daughter to be labeled guilty by association? Taylor says she knows this was not a victimless crime, a victim herself of sexual assault, something she informed the prosecution about on the record during jury selection. She says getting the right person and not just a person was deeply important to her. That experience demoralizes somebody. It makes you question why, it makes you wonder why, it makes you feel empty. But I wouldn't want to put that burden on somebody who didn't do that. Taylor wanted to be a lawyer before this 2009 trial. Her experience with the justice system, or injustice system as she calls it, changed that. But now, for the first time in a long time, she has hope. I hope that he's vindicated. I hope that I'm vindicated. I hope that my voice is heard as the juror that really I felt like I was disregarded. That was Paul Dudley reporting. The Supreme Court heard arguments in the case in December. The decision by the court could come by March or even sooner.